alumni welcome event, wellness event presented by the Deakin Business School Alumni Chapter. Also sending a warm virtual welcome to our presenters for tonight, Serena Sorrenti, Dr. Wolfgang Marx and Jenny Stedman. I'm Monique McKenzie, the president of the Deakin Business School Alumni Chapter. And today we are broadcasting live with fellow alumni committee members, Stefan, Akash and Lav, who are also, we are also joined by the Dean of the Business School, Professor Amanda Pyman, and our amazing Deakin alumni support team who have helped put this together. Thank you for joining us. As we gather for this event physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and in do, doing so, recognize the various traditional lands on which we reside and are listening in from tonight. We acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of all the lands we work and live on and their ancestral spirits with gratitude and respect. For those watching and for those who couldn't make it, today's webinar will be recorded and posted online on the Deakin Alumni YouTube channel. Today we are joined by the insightful Serena Wolf and Jenny. Serena will present tonight on mindfulness versus mindlessness. Wolf will explore the role food plays in mental health and Jenny will discuss resilience when working from home. Before we get started, you may have noticed that your microphones have been muted for the duration of the presentation. We encourage all participants to use the Q&A box, which you can see at the bottom of your screen labeled Q&A to submit any questions to the presenters and we'll get to them at the, at the end of the presentations. Tonight we are joined by Professor Amanda Pyman, Dean of the business, Deakin Business School. We will, be, we will begin with the Business School Faculty Update and now I'll hand over to Professor Amanda Pyman. Thanks. Thanks very much, Monique. Uh, good evening and welcome to everybody. Uh, this is my first uh, DBS alumni event in my new capacity, uh, so I'm delighted to be here and I'm particularly delighted to see the lineup of speakers that you have for uh, today's session or, or this evening. Uh, I would also like to pay my respects to the Wadawurrung, Wurundjeri and Gunta Jamara elders and peoples who are the traditional custodians of the land where Deakin's campuses are located. You may in fact be wondering who I am. Uh, I am the new uh, Dean of the Deakin Business School. Many of you will have come across Mark Ewing, who is our Executive Dean. We've now moved to a two school structure uh, with two deans. So I'm heading up the Business School uh, and Jenny Lytell is heads up the Law School. However, I'm not new to Deakin. I've been at Deakin uh, since 2015. Uh, and I have been in the business school. I have come from the role of head of department of management, uh, leading the largest department in DBS and recently been appointed as the Dean. Uh, so I guess I'm in my first 90 days in corporate speak and learning fast and, and uh, appreciating and relishing um, all the things that I'm learning. Uh, my disciplinary expertise or my academic expertise is in human resource management and employment relations. So a topic that's intimately related uh, to your wellness session tonight around managing your wellbeing through, through change. I don't think there's a more important topic uh, given the uncertain environment that, that we're working in. Um, just a couple of quick things about the business school. I look forward to the opportunity to interact with our alumni um, at various points and hopefully uh, in a physical um, environment at some point, though that seems a, a long way away at the moment. Uh, Deakin Business School is currently going through its strategic planning um, for 2021 to 2025 in line with the new university strategic plan. Uh, you will be consulted on that. You'll see um, that coming out to you in various forms. Um, but really, our mission is centred around being catalysts for positive change. Um, and again, I think that's a nice link to uh, today's session, particularly around uh, wellness, mindfulness and mental health and well-being. The other thing I just wanted to signal and, and that this topic is timely is that the university for the first time as part of its people and culture plan 
has uh, in fact this year launched a staff mental health and wellbeing strategy. So again, a very nice intersection with what you'll be discussing tonight. A soft plug before I finish and hand over to the experts that you're going to listen to tonight. Um, get involved in the business school in any way you can. A uh, couple of opportunities highlighted on the slide uh, in your own organisations if you're thinking about talent pipelines and wanting to access our talent pipelines, i.e. our students. Work integrated learning is a fantastic opportunity to do that. You can host a team-based consultancy project. You can host an individual internship. A great way to get involved and, and access that, those talented students that we have. From a professional development point of view, you might be interested in our MBA masterclasses. Uh, the schedule for the remaining classes for 21 is on the website and we're just in the process of uh, finalising 2022 uh, and they, those details will be shared with you once finalised. Um, so a range of options for you um, to, to get involved if you're thinking about that at the moment beyond the, the ways that you're already involved. Uh, so thank you uh, for having me along. I will finish up. Um, I wish you a great session tonight. I look forward to meeting each and every one of you in due course. Um, and what a fantastic session that we're going to hear from some wonderful speakers. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, Professor Amanda Pyman. We appreciate your attendance tonight and so happy you could share the update on the faculty. Next up, I would like to introduce you to our first presenter for the, for the evening, Serena Sorrenti. Serena is the co-founder and CEO of My Haven't Time, a mindful multimedia platform that captures your creativity and helps you focus, learn and perform. Serena is passionate about helping people and businesses be all they can be. She is an experienced strategic advisor, executive coach, author and investor. Serena has co-founded many startups and has a commercial and leadership experience in company scale up, mergers and acquisitions and corporate restructures. Serena is passionate about wellness, self-care and living a conscious life. Tonight, Serena will be discussing mindfulness versus mindlessness. Serena, thanks for joining us. Over to you. Thank you, Monique. Thank you so much. This is a real honour. Lovely, lovely to virtually meet people. I hope we're all in a good place. Um, I'm just really grateful to be here today. Uh, the world is in a very... Uh, unusual time uh, to be living in this world right now and I suppose the most important thing about the next hour or so is to be actually very present and take in all the wonderful tools that myself and the other two speakers will be sharing with you. So my topic in the next 15 minutes is going to focus really on mindfulness and how not to be mindless. Uh, I'm going to give you three tools um, to use, three very very basic and practical tools you can use every day. The first one being um, a checklist. And I've got a picture here of my dog, Bella. Bella's a Jack Russell, and she's probably the best picture of mindfulness. She's always present, always alert, never worries about the past, never gets lost in, in uh, mindlessness thinking. She's absolutely present. And when we're most present and conscious and aware, we can be our best selves. We can make great choices. We can manage our emotional state. We can choose how we live our best life. And that's really what mindfulness is all about. So right now, wherever you are in the world right now, I want you to think about when are you the most mindful or you're most present and conscious? And when are you the most mindless? Where you are uh, in automatic pilot and you drift away and time disappears. Just note that for yourself. Now, here's a checklist we can put in place. The next six steps I want us to actually use, I want this to be an action learning process to help you be more present and mindful. The first thing is I want you to be very body aware. So wherever you are, wriggle your toes, move your hands around, give yourself a hug, um, move your shoulders around and just remind yourself to get into this body of ours, this amazing body that we are gifted with today. Step number two, be aware of your breath. Breath is our life. Our life source, be aware of how you're breathing right now. Are you breathing in a shallow manner, in a deep manner, in a slow manner? Whatever it is, just tune into it. It's a great way, again, to get back into your body, back into your mind. 
Step number three is to be aware of your emotional state. We have emotions running through us all the time. And most of the time we are unaware of how these emotions are impacting us. Some of our emotions can be supportive. A lot of our emotions can be quite uh, interfering in being our best versions of ourselves. Right now, tune in to what you are feeling. Are you feeling tired, hungry, fearful, anxious, happy, excited? Whatever the feeling is, own it. It's yours. Record it, note it, note how you're feeling right now. This is a great thing to do on a daily basis or during the day to help you understand how your emotional state actually shapes who you are and the choices you're making. Step four, hopefully you're still with me and you haven't, you haven't become mindless, you're still with me right now. Step four is to actually tune in to your internal chatter, your self-talk. We all have it. Our self-talk can be absolutely supportive, uh, encouraging our internal coach can be amazing or our internal chatter can be quite demeaning and again interfering to being our best selves tune in right now if you've got great self-talk applaud it and be grateful if you've got some negative self-talk right now note it and what I'd like you to do is tune out of it tune it down Number five is stopping the distractions. So I don't know where you are and what you're doing. So hopefully you're, you have very little distractions around you. But when we have distractions, all that noise, we can't be our best versions of ourselves. We are, we are spreading ourselves very thinly. We only give attention to small bits and pieces around us. And sometimes the bits and pieces can be quite uh, negative to, our, to, 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 again, being our best version of ourselves. So think about what distractions you have. Uh, when people would come into my workshops, I, I usually give them this little cube. And this cube is, a, I call it a conscious cube. It's a very tactile way of being present in the moment. So if you don't have a cube, I'd encourage you to have a pen, a, a necklace or a pendant, or a ring, a watch, something that physically helps you be here and helps you to be focused. And this is what we're about, being focused uh, the best way we can. Step number six, you have chosen consciously or unconsciously, but I think it's consciously to be here tonight. Why? What's your intention for tonight's session? What do you need to get out of this? Tune into that. Focus on that and make sure you amplify it throughout this whole session. And at the end of the session, please check back to it and see whether your intention has been satisfied. So that's my first tool for you is to live like my dog and also to have a six step ch checking in process for mindfulness. You can do this check checklist proactively or you can do it reactively when you feel yourself become mindless. I would always encourage to be proactive. Here's our second one. Our second one now is around creating a habit stacking or habits on top of habits to help you um, be mindful. This is an infographic that I've pulled together to describe my best mindfulness habits. These are daily and weekly rituals I put into place. I've grouped them into three areas, but you can group them into three or two, or there's my dog, Bella, if you haven't heard her, she's, she's barking, unfortunately. Um, you can put, group them into anything that you think is relevant for you. I just wanna make a very personal statement here about mindfulness. Mindfulness to me is, is a life-saving process. Uh, back in 2013, I found a lump uh, the size of a golf ball under my arm. I was diagnosed with cancer. And at that point in my life, I was not mindful. <laughs> I was very mindless. I was so focused on doing so much in my life. My life was so busy and full of pleasing others and doing lots of should things in my life. But in that moment, in 2013, I realized that if I didn't put my, my life well-being and healing first, I wouldn't be here. So since then, my mindfulness practices are for me life-saving. Wellness is now a, a huge priority, my, my, my first priority in my life. And that's why I'm still in remission and still here with you, able to share that with you. So my three categories I've got mindset. For me, mindset is probably the most important, and that's really getting my head, um, my highest self in the driver's seat of my life, rather than um, focusing too much on the past or worrying about the future or, you know, being distracted by others' perspectives or the news or, or what's going around us. So for me, three really important things I do in my mindset habits is, and I'm a morning person, so this is what works for me in the morning, is when I wake up, 
rather than just drift off and into uh, scattered mind thoughts, which can happen, I visualize my ideal day. One minute it takes me. And what I'm doing is I'm focusing my mind on what I want, what I need, and how I want to be impactful for my day. One minute every morning. The second thing I do is I meditate, and meditation is important for me. And every different people, lots of people meditate in different ways. For me, I have a 15 minute uh, meditation. I've had different meditations during my life. The one that's useful for me right now is called Bliss, Bliss Brain by uh, Dawson Church. And I, for me, it just is a great way of tuning into a very positive state of mind. The third thing I do, probably four, four to five times a week, is I do a cold plunge cold pool plunge a cold pool plunge um, is invigorating and those 10 minutes that I'm in that pool feels like an hour it's like time then time expands and I'm so conscious of my mindset I'm so focused I notice everything and I'm, I'm slightly out of my comfort zone so I'm really aware and awake and very alive so there's three things I do around mindset what do you do around your mindset please pull something together, some infographic around mindset, things that you're already doing, things you'd like to do, things you, you might maybe need to stop doing as well that may hinder your mindset. The second grouping is number two is movement. Movement is everything for me. I'm, I love dancing. I love walking. I love martial arts. At the moment, I combine dancing, walking the dog, doing weights, tai chi. On different days, I have a different combination of that. And for me, movement is so important because um, I need my cells to keep moving and regenerating and feeling great. And I need my immunity up as we all do right now. So find, I find with movement, you need to find something that you enjoy, not endure. If you endure it, it won't be exciting and happy and something to look forward to. So find a combination of movement. It could be um, it could be playing golf. It could, well, when we could play golf, it could be um, uh, push-ups it could be uh, walking or uh, paddling on a boat whatever it is that makes you happy the main thing that gives you energy but also physically moves your body is so important for you and the third grouping I have is nourishment and for me nourishment is really important that I'm feeding my body and I'm treating my body with respect and um, with love and for me the 16-8 by Michael Mosley fasting is really important for me I do that uh, six days a, a week and I know Wolf was going to talk a lot more about this so I'm just going to briefly describe what I do what's what serves me um, and I have more of a plant-based diet and they're the things I put in place but more importantly is I try and put these disciplines in place like a habit on top of a habit so I've got my morning ritual where I visualize my day I meditate I walk the dog I do a cold plunge and that sort of combination of activities reinforces each other. So you look forward to the next habit and that, that becomes a grouping of habits. Uh, and then I scatter those other activities during, during the week. So my challenge to you with this tool number two is come up with your own infographic for mindfulness, put in the things that will stretch you, but also um, help you be the best you can be. Life is too short not to do this. Life is too short to waste, particularly given what we're going through right now. Um, there's too much external stimulus that can really bring us down. When we're back in the driver's seat of our life, we can control one thing. We can control how we feel. We can control how we, we eat. We can control how we exercise. We can control how we live our life the best we can in the conditions in the environment we're in. So that was number two. Number three, um, this is our new platform, My Haven Time. It was designed purposely to help people focus, be more creative, and obviously be more mindful. Uh, we, we started this 18 months ago. It's been an idea that's been rolling around in our heads for 10 years. Uh, we're really excited about creating this beautiful space where you can journal your ideas, um, build up your learning, build up your creativity. So I have rooms in my haven time. So think about it as a platform with beautiful rooms of your favorite things. So I have my learning room where I've got at the moment, my favorite thing is all around about brain intelligences and different forms of intelligence, where I add in and upload quotes, um, diagrams, uh, YouTubes, uh, references, and I combine that with then my own insights and learning. 
So I, we call these gems. You know, learning is such an active process. And for me, going back and adding to that gem and adding more insights as I get more information makes it more exciting, more insightful, and much deeper in types of terms of learning. So it helps me really focus. The, the, I think the differentiator of our platform is there is no advertising, no data is sold, there are no, there's no distraction. It's purely there for you to grow. So if you're interested in exploring this a little bit more, um, probably uh, the best thing to do would be come, go onto our website um, where we have a website called myhaventime.com and um, follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our blogs. That's probably a good way to get started just to see whether something like that could be useful for you or for any of the alumni members. So I'm very mindful I've thrown three different tools at you in like such a short period of time. I'm so hoping that you're still with me. Um, so in summary, this is what I would really love you to take away. Call to action is firstly, number one, apply Mindfulness habits that serve you. Be discerning. Don't make them too easy. Don't make them too hard. Just make them right. Uh, it does take discipline. It does take focus. It's not something you just do on a retreat once a year and then forget about it. It's daily, even hourly habits at times to be mindful. And right now, more than ever, do we need human beings to be more mindful? and more consciously caring about themselves. Because as we care about themselves, the ripple effects is that we care then about our families, our circle, our community, our world. So please think about what you're doing right now that minim absolutely minimizes harm to you, to, your, to, your, to the people who, who you love and the people you care about, and obviously our world. So I think I'm nearly done. So hopefully this is a nice little appetizer for you. And um, we've got some beautiful speakers from, from Wolf and from Jenny who will continue now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Serena. Very grateful for you taking the opportunity to outline, um, number one, the checklist that we can tick through ourselves to be more present and mindful in our own ways. Um, your mind, mindset story is extremely powerful and it's so great that you've been able to channel that passion into your platform my having time so thank you for sharing next up i would like to introduce you to our next speaker dr wolfgang marx dr wolfgang marx is a joint alfred deacon and multiple sclerosis research australia postdoctoral research fellow and head of the nutris nutris i'm sorry i can't pronounce that word that's or on my behalf, sorry, research stream at the Food and Moods Moon Centre. Wolfgang is also a dietitian and an honorary research fellow at the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Men Mental Health, La Trobe University and Bonn University. Wolf's current research program offers a broad range of projects involving the use of nutraceuticals for mental health, fatigue, and cognition. I got it that time. Of particular interest is the poly polyphenols, compounds found abundantly in spices, fruits and vegetables, in brain health and gut microbiome. Tonight, Dr. Wolfgang Marx will be discussing food and mental health. Over to you, Wolf, and apologies for the pronunciation difficulties no, no. there. You did very well. There are a lot of words that don't really come up in normal conversation, so uh, but well done. Um, I'm just going to check that i can click on all right great um so thanks for having me today um as uh um as i was introduced my name is uh wolfgang marx i'm a research fellow at deacon's food and mood center and i suppose as the name suggests um we look at the role of the food that we eat the nutrients that we consume in our mental health and our mood and so tonight i'm going to be giving you an overview of what we know so far about the link between nutrition and mental health. I'll talk a little bit about the gut microbiome and how that interacts with, uh, with that, that link. And then I'm gonna end with some uh, take home messages that we can incorporate into our daily lives. So I'm gonna start by, I suppose, surprising no one by saying that our diets have changed. If we compare our diet to our 
caveman ancestors, they did not have access to, you know, Uber Eats, they did not have access to 24 seven, hyper palatable, uh, high fat, high sugar, um, high energy foods around the clock. And what's happened now because of this dramatic change in our food environment, um, we're uh, in a situation where if we look at the Australian population as a whole, we can see that more than 95% of Australians are not eating enough uh, vegetables and, and legumes. Or looking at that another way, 4.4% of us are consuming enough uh, of fruits and vegetable, of, of vegetables. And if we zoom into our children, we can see that that picture is, is even more serious. So that's 0.4% of our children are meeting the recommended daily serves of vegetables per day. Now, if I were to ask you to guess where we're replacing all that energy from, <clears throat> I'm sure you can guess that it's really from that hyper palatable, ultra processed foods. Um, so this was a figure from a recent paper that we published where we looked at the consumption of these processed foods across various data sets all across the world. And while um, at the American data set had 58% of energy coming from these ultra processed foods, this was not uh, an outlier. You can see that this is relatively similar all across the globe. If we change gears for a second and then look at the current state of, of, of our mental health, I suppose, if we look at the global burden of disease, you can see that compared to all other chronic diseases, it's those neuropsychiatric disorders that are accounting for the largest proportion of uh, global burden of disease. And if we were to zoom in on that slice of the pie, if you were, um, you'd see that it's really those common mental disorders. So depression and anxiety, that it's really driving this large burden of disease. So given that, um, that, that large proportion of, of burden that's attributed to neuropsychiatric disorders, while we have you know, some excellent treatments, both pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy that are important interventions for our mental health and for treating mental illness, this uh, data suggests, well, there's, there's more to be done. And what I think is really an interesting and an exciting area is this renewed interest in uh, lifestyle interventions, things like physical activity, uh, proper sleep, and of course, nutrition. Slight lag. Uh, yes, uh, sorry. Um, so I guess the next point is, well, what do we know so far about the evidence that's linking adequate nutrition to our mental health? Well, if we look at observational studies, that's where we look at large groups of people that have a high quality diet and we assess their risk of depression compared to those that have a low quality diet, we can see that there's this consistent um, uh, effect across studies. When we pull all those, those studies together, we see that roughly there's about a 30% reduced risk of depression uh, for, uh, for people that adhere to a high quality diet. And we have used uh, various methods of assessing a high quality diet, be that a Mediterranean style diet, a low inflammatory diet, um, a healthy eating, uh, adherence to healthy eating guidelines, all seem to show this consistent effect. And what's really uh, promising is that while a lot of the evidence from these observational studies are in adulthood, we can see this effect across, or this association across the lifespan. So both in childhood and adolescence, but what's also interesting is that there's an association in parenthood, meaning that the um, diet of the mother during pregnancy seems to have an effect on the behavioral outcomes of the infant as well. So this is in this sort of generational um, aspect to it, which is really interesting. But of course, these are all associations. What we need to do is move this into randomized controlled trials. These are our gold standard methods of assessing whether factor A is, 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 is causing uh, factor a, a Y. And so um, we need to translate this into randomized controlled trials to ensure that there, there isn't some other uh, potential explanation that might be confounding our results. 
And so we ran a randomized controlled trial to do exactly that. That, that was the SMILES trial. And this was the first trial that intended to look at the effect of a dietary intervention in people with clinical depression to see if that improved their mood. We randomized 67 adults with clinical depression. Um, this was on top of any current treatment that they were receiving. This was a 12 week intervention and they were randomized to receive either a dietary intervention or a non-dietary control group. And what we found at the end of that, those 12 weeks was this really marked improvement in depressive symptoms. So as you can see in both groups, there was this improvement compared to baseline, but the people that received the dietary intervention had the strongest reduction um, in depressive symptoms, uh, both compared to baseline as well as to the control group. And there was so much so that at 12 weeks, 32% of the dietary support group achieved remission criteria. So we were really obviously quite excited by these results. And what's uh, even more promising is now there's a whole host of different uh, researchers um, from other institutions that have replicated our, our results, both within Australia and across the globe, which adds that extra level of, um, I suppose, rigor to these, this potential uh, um, uh, link. So now that we've looked at the, um, the, the, the link between nutrition and mental health, one of the questions that then arises, well, what is it about diet that drives this, this link? You know, what, what is it about diet that's improving our mood? And one of the key areas that our center is looking at, as well as researchers all over the world, is the role of the gut microbiome. So this is called the gut-brain axis. That is the communication between the bacteria that reside in our gastrointestinal tract and how they influence processes within our brain. This is being um, investigated for a whole host of different chronic conditions and illnesses, things like IBS, stroke, epilepsy, and of course, psychiatric disorders. And one of the really um, promising things about the gut microbiome in its link with our mental health is that there are there are a whole host of things that can influence the gut microbiome, but we know that diet is one of the key drivers of um, changing the gut microbiome, both in terms of its composition and function, which makes diet a really powerful tool to uh, investigate further. And indeed, our group has a number of projects that are looking at different dietary interventions that directly target the, the gut microbiome and looking at its effect on um, our mental health, mood and cognition. So now that we've talked about some of the evidence, you can see that there's a lot of emerging areas. There's a lot of uh, strong support within the literature that, assert, that links what we eat to our mental health. Now, while this uh, evidence is still emerging, um, you know, what strategies can we uh, begin to incorporate into our, our everyday life that are based on the current evidence and what we know so far? Well, one of the key take-home messages is looking to boost our intake of those whole foods, those plant-based foods, so things like vegetables, fruits, and nuts. And one of the ways that you can do that is to include vegetables at each meal. And the reason why I say that is because Generally speaking, as Australians, we get the bulk of our vegetables at dinner time. That's, that's really our, our main meal that accounts for a large proportion of the vegetables that we consume. But if we shift that focus and, and try and to incorporate vegetables in, into other meals, as well as fruits and nuts, um, we can sort of improve, the, the, I guess, the feasibility of consuming a higher level of, of fruits, vegetables, and those whole foods. Similarly, selecting fruits, vegetables, and nuts as snacks. That's another method of trying to incorporate these fruits, vegetables, and, and whole foods into different uh, meals throughout the day. Aiming to eat beans and lentils two to three times a week. This is, um, you know, again, as, as Australians, we don't tend to eat uh, very many beans as, as a population um, compared to many other cultures and, and regions around the world. But these are really, you know, high protein, high fiber, high antioxidant uh, food groups that are also really cheap and they can store well in your pantry and, and everything. And they're, they're really quite a, a really nutrient dense source 
uh, that we can incorporate into our diet. Um, eating oily fish at least two times a week. This is at least in part because of the omega-3 fatty acids that are incorporated in, in oily fish. And the, these omega-3 fatty acids, um, while also being healthy for our heart, seem to be um, very important to our brain health and mental health. Uh, consuming uh, extra virgin olive oil as our main fat source in our diet um, or, or culinary oil. And this is one because of the composition of fat. So it's, it, it has a high composition of those healthy fats, those monounsaturated, polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids, but it's also rich in a unique type of, um, of, of antioxidants that are not found in other types of cooking oils. Lastly, there's a few um, additional uh, tips that I can provide that, that talk a bit more specifically um, around improving our, our microbiome and what seems to be um, contributing to a, a healthy composition in our microbiome. So first of all, is consuming or incorporating fermented foods into our diet. Um, these, uh, by that, I mean foods that have these, pro these probiotic bacteria, those live active cultures, um, things like yogurt, as well as a whole host of different fermented foods that are on the market now, things like kimchi, sauerkraut, kefir, all those sorts of things. Um, consuming fiber. Um, the reason why is because fiber is essentially the fuel for our gut microbiome. So when we eat fiber, our gut microbes really eat the fiber. And this process uh, produces um, these compounds called short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids have um, a whole host of different, what we think to be beneficial properties, things like anti-inflammatory properties that we think are linked to our mental health. Eating a wide range of vegetables that have a, a, a wide range of colors. And the reason why I say that is the pigment that's responsible for colors and fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, why a blueberry is blue, for example, is because of these compounds called polyphenols. And these polyphenols, amongst a whole host of different uh, beneficial properties, seem to be really important um, to uh, the composition of our gut microbiome. Uh, resistant starch. Uh, I, I don't have time to go too much into this, but essentially this is a unique source of fiber. And we can find those in more starchy vegetables and, and plant foods, things like oats, legumes, cooked and cooled rice, potatoes, and pasta. And I guess on the other side of the coin is reducing our intake of those processed foods and those high fat foods because they seem to be um, having a negative effect on our, on our gut microbiome. So in summary, and I guess some of the key take home messages is that diet is linked with our mental health across the lifespan. Diet is modifiable and may lower our risk of depression. Diet may also alter mood by changing our gut microbiota. And really at the end of the day, a healthy diet for our mental health is really just a healthy diet. So it's not about you know, specialty diets or specialty supplements or anything like that. It really is about those core messages of improving our whole food consumption while reducing our ultra processed food consumption. If you are interested in learning more about the link between food and mood, we have a free online course that's designed uh, towards the, the general public. And you can find that either on our website or if you uh, Google it. Um, and if you want to follow along with what we're doing, please visit us at our website or follow us on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Wolf. Your presentation covers so many interesting facts on the effects of food on our mental health, mental health which is so important nowadays, uh, especially through the lockdowns in Victoria and New South Wales. I liked the listings of food, of mood boosting foods that can be incorporated into our everyday diets. Um, it's extremely helpful um, and many thanks for your time. Next up, I would like to introduce to you uh, our next presenter, Jenny Steadman. Jenny is a senior consultant at The Potential Project where she runs corporate mind training programs in Australia and internationally. Jenny is also a qualified and experienced teacher of the world-renowned Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. Jenny is passionate about helping people live with more mindfulness and kindness, both in their personal lives and in the corporate world. 
Her lengthy corporate background means she is well placed to offer insightful mindfulness training that helps employees and entities unlock their potential. Over her career, she has worked in organizational strategy, transformation, program management, leadership development, change management, learning and development, reward and recognition, recruitment, and more. Tonight, Jenny will be discussing supercharging resilience with optimism. Over to you, Jenny. Thanks. Thanks very much, Monique. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you this evening, and thank you for that introduction. A tagline for my presentation could really be moving from coping to thriving. And it's coping that I want to start with because so often we just kind of gloss over coping. We think that we've got to hit those goals and we've got to be really super achieving. Otherwise, we're not good enough. But I really want to start with that coping and particularly because at the moment we're in extended lockdown and that's been going on for a long time for people in our friends in Melbourne as well. I'm outside of Sydney. And sometimes the best that we can muster is simply to cope. Now, to illustrate a story or to illustrate this, I want to give you a story from my own personal life. And that requires going way back in ancient history to when I was 15 years old. Because when I was 15, I started my second last year of high school, year 11, and I got a music scholarship to study at a private school down in Sydney. I lived in more of a regional town at the time, so it wasn't possible for me to commute between the two places. And it wasn't a boarding school, and I didn't have any family in Sydney that I could live with. So my parents made the decision that for me to be able to take up this scholarship and go to this school, I'd have to live alone. So within about the week or so, within the week, a few days before school started, I moved into this one bedroom unit. And from then on, I was living on my own. And now that started what was one of the most challenging, terrifying, and excruciatingly lonely stages of my life. Now, it was challenging for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> one of the reasons was because the school that I went to was completely dem different demographics to the school that I had come from. And the academic standard was much higher as well. But like kids were getting dropped off to school in gold Rolls Royces. Like I hadn't experienced that. I thought I'd been dropped into a bunch of aliens. I didn't even know how to talk to them. I was that sort of nervous about being around people like that. But it was also challenging because I had to learn to look after myself. I had to learn to cook and to clean. And oh my gosh, I had some doozies when it came to cooking. Like there was this time when I was cooking my first ever casserole from the Women's Weekly Beginner's Cookbook, but you cannot go wrong. And the recipe called for one cup of stock. Now that's pretty straightforward, right? One cup of stock. But I thought that meant one cup of stock cubes. And so anyway, I took this casserole out of the oven and I took a photo of it. I was so proud of it. And then I tasted it and it was like the most disgusting thing I had ever tasted. There was also getting myself around on public transport because I played in a band and an orchestra five days a week. I had rehearsals that had nothing to do with the school, several suburbs away and often rehearsing late at night. So I was actually really quite terrified about all of that as well. And it was also new to me. And I had already experienced a couple of traumatic events before moving into living on my own. So I was already carrying a bit of a load of trauma with me, not helped by the fact that there was a serial killer literally active within my neighboring streets. I was right in the epicenter. And even though I wasn't part of his target demographic, I was still terrified, like going into the garbage bin room that was in the basement underneath my block of flats was something that just was really terrifying. And then there was just the extreme loneliness. Like I'm the youngest of six kids. I had never been alone. And then all of a sudden I was on my own. And so every evening I basically stared at the telephone, begging it to ring. And I would also stare at that little keychain across my door, begging that it would keep me safe. But basically I would just bawl my eyes out every night to the point where I couldn't speak. So it wouldn't have mattered if somebody had phoned me because I couldn't speak. And eventually I'd fall asleep, a sleep filled with nightmares just to wake up the next day to the nightmare of the life that I was living. And then one day, 
somehow, somewhere, I have no memory of this anymore, I came across a piece of paper and I've got that exact piece of paper. It's now a, um, an antique here with me. I've actually never showed it to anyone before. I cut it out of the newspaper. I cut it very carefully, you'll be able to see. And it's a cartoon. It's a cartoon, just one frame. I hope you can see it okay then. It's a man sitting at a desk, at a work desk, looking a bit overwrought. And then there's that one sign, the sign there with the one word. And that word is cope. And if I turn over, you might be able to see the little blobs of blue tack. Because this was 36 years ago. I, I stuck it to my mirror. And every day I looked at this word cope. And I just asked today, could I please just cope? That was all I wanted out of the day was just to cope. I, I couldn't imagine anything more than that. And so my first message to you is if you're feeling challenged by the situation that you're in at the moment with extended lockdown, extended working from home, then that's natural and to be expected. Really, it's a type of grief. And if the most that you can muster at the moment is just to cope, well, then I say big tick like successful day, good on you. And then when the time is right, and you'll know when that is, you'll probably want to move then from coping to thriving. And I want to talk about how we can do that with this thing that I call wise optimism. Now to illustrate wise optimism, I've got another story for you. I don't need to spend long on it because it's a story that you would know so well. The story that you'd <laughs> we all know so well of Nelson Mandela and just thinking about the 27 years that he spent in prison and he that was because of anti-apartheid activity 27 years and during that time he had minimal contact with his wife and his mother died his firstborn son died in a car accident and he was forbidden from attending either of those funerals and in his book Long Walk to Freedom he said about the death of his son, that tragedy. He said, what can one say about such a tragedy? I was already overwrought about my wife. I was still grieving for my mother. And then to hear such news, I do not have words to express the sorrow or the loss that I felt. It left a hole in my heart that can never be filled. And I just can't imagine that. And so he talked about two key points. In, he went on to talk about it in his book. The first of those points was that he realised he had to accept the situation that he was in. That didn't mean that he liked it or anything like that, but just a rad what we call a potential project, radical acceptance. He had to accept the reality of the situation that, was, that he was in, eyes wide open. And then the second point that he goes on to talk about is that he didn't ever consider the possibility that he would not get out of prison. And he was always actively working towards that day where he would get his freedom. Significant, when he arrived at Robben Island, the warden said to him, this is Robben Island, here you will die. And yet he always thought that he would be getting out of prison. So these two things are what I like to refer to as wise optimism. And this is what can help us go on that journey from coping through to thriving. And it's really a mindset. Neuroplasticity tells us that this is trainable. This type of wise optimism that I'm going to go into with a few practical tips in a moment is trainable. And we can get from that point where it becomes something that we occasionally experience to a state to becoming a trait, something that just becomes part of who we are. So now, four practical tips. And maybe you want to play along with me here as I talk about these tips by bringing to mind a situation that might be challenging for you at the moment. And maybe you can just bring that to mind right now, thinking about who is involved with this situation or where you are, or what might be that flavor of that challenge for you. You don't have to pick your most difficult, challenging situation. So then getting into these four tips, and the first of these is on along the lines of what I was talking about with Nelson Mandela which is radical acceptance. 
radical acceptance. So radical acceptance really begins with an accurate, realistic understanding about the situation that you're in right now. And that also comes with that, perhaps, the wisdom and the courage to be able to face the discomfort that comes with that reality. Now, I know we've got so many ways in which we want to avoid or numb out that discomfort. Like it might be food. That's been one of mine in the past, maybe eating a little bit too much. It might be drinking for people. It might be just working too hard or it might be Netflix binging or it might be the doom scrolling on Facebook, whatever it might be. An alternative to those sort of numbing out strategies. An alternative as a starting point to getting into that direction of wise optimism could be, first of all, it's simple, not always easy to remember, has a big impact, but just starting with taking three deep breaths. And maybe we'll just do that now as you bring to mind that challenging situation. You might think of what is the thing that sort of just contracts you and just tightens you inside and might lead to reactivity. So now let's just take a couple of deep breaths, just breathing all the way in, and then all the way out. And it's the out breath that I want you to particularly savour. So again, all the way in, and then all the way out and feeling that letting go, that sort of release of that unnecessary effort or tension that's there in the body. So that tip number one, the radical acceptance and then starting that with the three deep breaths. Now, the second tip to go with this is what meaning can we derive from this challenging situation? This, some people refer to it as post-traumatic growth, or you might like to look at the work of um, Dr. Frankel, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning as a Holocaust Survivor. But what meaning can we make from it? If I get a little bit more practical with it, it might be considering with your situation, what are the strengths that are emerging for you? Like, what are you learning about yourself? Well, you've got capacities that you maybe didn't know that you had. And sure, we might see some vulnerabilities as well, but what are the strengths that are emerging for you? And perhaps you can identify what's important to you, what's important as you go through this challenging situation, which takes me to the third of the four tips, which is then knowing what's important to us, what's the wise action that you can take, that wise action that might be taking you towards that thing that's important. Now, you've heard about a bunch of things this evening that would fit into that category of wise action, whether it's our diet, making changes to that, whether it is taking up mindfulness, whether it's taking your work outside into the sunshine, or might it be shortening or cancelling a meeting? Might it be starting a, a gratitude journal? Or if that's too much, just thinking of one thing that to be grateful for each day. And if that's too much, because that might be hard in these difficult times, maybe even just setting the intention, may I one day be open to being able to feel these things that I'm grateful for? It might be having an extra glass of water. It might be taking the dog for a walk or just patting the dog and really being there for the feeling of patting the dog. There's a bunch of things. And so as you consider your situation and what's important to you, what would be that wise action, that step that you could take? I wonder what that would be. And then maybe you could just make that a little commitment and it, this doesn't have to be a big step it could be something tiny can you make that commitment tonight tomorrow to put that in place maybe something for your self-care in that way i wish i could hear how you go with it and then the fourth well you can you can make contact with me if you wish i'd love to hear how you go and then the fourth step is to actually embrace setbacks and that means letting go of our expectations of the way that things should be or could be because if we look at the where we are right now and we look at where we want to get to, there can be a chasm in between and we might fall into a bit of an abyss and that leads to apathy. So maybe when we feel that, oh, I wish it was like that or I hope that it's like that or when will it be like that, maybe we can just let go of those expectations and just coming back into what we're dealing with right at the moment with that wise step there. So... 
what did I do then as a 15 year old, a 15, 16, 17 year old? And I wanna relate it to those four steps. So that radical acceptance, the first thing I had to do, and I remember this time where I realized that this was the life that I was now living in. And I could not go back. I couldn't undo everything that had been put in place to pick up my life the way that it was. The door that I had walked through had not only shut, it had evaporated, disappeared, gone. And I, you know, as much as I didn't like and I found it so challenging, I just had to accept this was the life that I was leading right now. And then the meaning making, I've discovered some strengths that I had inside of me and I considered what was important to me as well. And what was important to me was not to drown. I didn't want to drown. I knew I couldn't go back to what I had. But I also knew that by drowning figuratively, that I would lose whatever opportunity I had in this new life. And so that led to my third action, my third tip, the third step there, which is wise action. And I did two things that I remember as being very significant to me. The first was I took up mindfulness meditation 36 years ago, and it still is a big part of my life today. And it's a big part of the work that I do with Potential Project taking mindfulness into companies and helping to make the world of work more human. Big part of a daily part of my life right now. And the other thing that I did was I just got organized. So my school worked on a fortnightly timetable and I built around that my own fortnightly timetable, which I looked at, when did I have a free period? What music rehearsals did I have? When did they happen? So then that helped me to build this timetable where I knew this is the time I have to wake up and uh, this is when I can do my study. This is when I have to cook my meal. This is when I do my travel. This is when I do my own personal music practice. And that really saved me. But then of course I had setbacks, like that wasn't, not, neither of those steps that I took were gonna be, you know, the end of my struggles with things. It wasn't, I had setbacks, but I began to see over time that no, I will be able to do this. I will be able to achieve. So coming back to the beginning with, with all of this, I hope that those four steps will be helpful for you, but I also want to take it back to that coping as well. And if, like I said at the beginning, if coping is what you're able to do at the moment, given the circumstances, then I say, go you, absolutely go you. If you need a copy of my cartoon, I'll send it to you. But I want to wish you all the best and thank you for giving me this opportunity of sharing these stories and these tips. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Now more than ever, I guess, working from home, sometimes where it may seem a bit endless, um, that's such a, an important keyword message to cope. You know, um, I really relate to your question, um, the cartoon, you know, can I please just cope today? Um, that was really powerful. Thank you. So actually acknowledging that coping throughout these lockdowns is one of the mechanism, mechanisms that will allow us to thrive. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for reminding us to breathe, have a drink of water, mm -hmm. do something for our self-care, be able to let go of our ex expectations and um, be organised in a way that suits us. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, we're, we're now going to move into a bit of a discussion with our presenters today. So this will be led by my fellow chapter committee representative, Stefan. So now it's time for any attendees to write any questions that you might have in the Q&A box on your screen um, and then submit and the, everyone will, will go through and answer. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. Uh, thank you to all our wonderful presenters uh, for such an insightful and much needed discussion. Uh, given today's challenging climate. Um, so we've had a few questions that have come through during the webinar. Um, so I'll start with a question for Jenny. Um, and this is a question from Melissa. So Melissa says, I struggle with working from home, uh, especially outlining a productive workspace in my home. Do you have any tips or advice to make this work? Jenny? Sure, so the workspace, that's one, one thing definitely to consider and whether it is possible to create at least just a little bit of space there. I know some of us live in tiny units that we're sharing with partners and 
children and dogs and that may not be possible to have that permanently there it might be a section of the dining table but I think if we can have a little bit of uncluttered space but I think maybe even more so than that is the mindset that we bring to it and so I've got three more little tips for you and this will be very very quick but it's what we call a potential project the smart morning routine which and this can be really powerful we hear this all the time we call this the two 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 so starting off your day, you're sitting down to work and instead of just jumping straight into action and then, you know, answering emails that may not have been your priority, 222, which is just starting with two minutes of a bit of a mindfulness practice, just feeling your breath, or maybe it's just looking at the tree out of the window. But as we do that, we're actually engaging the parasympathetic nervous system and we're, we're calming, it's that rest and digest. Only two minutes, set a timer. Then two minutes writing down what are your priorities for the day? What's important to you rather than everybody else's priorities? Setting the timer for that. And then two minutes planning out when are you going to do that in your day to the best of your ability with the amount of agency that you've got over how your day works out. But the two, 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 two minutes of just calming yourself, a bit of mindfulness, two minutes of working out what your priorities are and two minutes of planning it. With that in place, it kind of doesn't matter, I suppose, if there's a partner working right beside you on Zoom calls as well and there's other stuff going on because it kind of gets you into the right mind space for the start of the day. Hope that helps. Lovely. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks. Great tips as always. Um, unfortunately, Serena uh, has had to pop off, uh, but we'll continue with all the questions with Jenny and Wolf. The next question that we have is for Dr. Wolfgang Marx. Um, Wolf, uh, Janet asks, um, and the question comes in two parts. Um, the first part is, what is inflammation-free diet? And then does it help in multiple sclerosis? Sure, uh, so that's a great question. So um, one of the sort of methods that we look to assess, I guess, uh, a healthy diet versus a, a, a low quality, um, uh, 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 energy rich diet is through, um, this index we call the dietary inflammatory index. And essentially, um, instead of zooming in on, you know, one food group or one particular nutrient or one particular food, uh, it looks at the diet as a whole and it sort of ranks that based on whether it's a sort of pro-inflammatory diet or whether it's a more anti-inflammatory diet. And what this really looks like in, in, in real life uh, in terms of an anti-inflammatory diet really just looks quite similar to what we think of as a, a, as a healthy diet. So this is something that's rich in those um, whole foods, plants, um, rich in these things called polyphenols that are found in things like berries, extra virgin olive oil, um, and the like. And if you're actually, if you're, if you're interested in learning um, more around the link between these sort of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory diets, we've recently written an article in the conversation that you can probably Google that breaks down the, the evidence as well as um, what you can do to improve your diet to have it a more anti-inflammatory effect. Um, in relation to multiple sclerosis, the evidence for um, diet in relation to multiple sclerosis is, is really um, emerging right now. There's a, it's really uh, similar to mental health. There's been this really renewed interest in the role of lifestyle factors and interventions in, in multiple sclerosis. And certainly some of the evidence that um, I've been involved in as well as groups um, around Australia and I, I suppose internationally have been showing that this um, anti-inflammatory diet as well as things like vitamin D, fish oil, uh, these sorts of things seems to have a, a uh, beneficial effect on either the onset of multiple sclerosis or potentially its progression. So yeah, it, it, it may be an effective thing, but we need some uh, clinical trials um, to sort of take this forward at the moment. Great, thanks Wolf. Got another question, and this is quite a good one actually. Um, Ben uh, asks, I struggle to switch off at nightly, at night mentally from work. What is the best 
way to approach this? Over to you. Okay, do you want me to jump in there, Wolf? Is sure, sure. Idea? I think that's much more on your wheelhouse. <laughs> I, can, I can find my anecdotes, but I think you're, you're much more suited for this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so struggling to switch off that. First of all, that is not surprising. There is so much going on. A couple of brief, maybe um, suggestions or tips that you could just experiment with. One of those might be cutting down the, the digital activity, maybe for the last hour before you go to bed. So cutting back on screen time. And one thing that can help with that is moving from the conceptual activities that we're doing of looking at screens or sending emails or catching up on that last bit of work at the end of the night and moving to perceptual activities, which is something that's about using the senses in our body so maybe that's a good reason for actually procrastinating doing the dishes. Leave that till your hour before going to bed and just doing that and feeling the feel of the water, the, your hands in the water, or maybe it's taking the dog for a walk, or maybe it's just doing a bit of stretching and spending all day in a, you know, squished into a chair looking at a little camera thing for a lot of people. Not great for our bodies. So maybe in that last hour, that's also about just doing a little bit of stretching or doing a little bit of mindfulness or meditation. All of that can help with being able to notice those times when we're just getting caught up in the thinking and the thinking. But being able to just flick off that switch at the end of the night is pretty hard for most of us. I know it's hard for me. I actually need that hour of really just beginning to slow down a little bit and doing more of those perceptual activities rather than the conceptual ones. But you also might want to just sit on the edge of your bed before actually getting into bed and doing, again, just two minutes of just a relaxation type exercise. Um, there are apps for that, or it's just bringing your focus to your breath. Again, that calming. And then you're laying down in bed and then more than just focusing on your breath. It's just a general relaxation, feeling the weight of your body supported by the bed and then turning over and just allowing yourself to fall asleep. I wouldn't say any of these are quick fixes, but I think we tend to stay conceptual, watching telly, being on social media, doing our work up until very close to bedtime and bringing in some of those body oriented activities within that last hour or 45 minutes might be able to help. And having a good meal, Wolf, <laughs> no, earlier exactly, on in the exactly. evening, perhaps. Oh, and no stimulants, no stimulants within the last probably two hours, caffeine, alcohol, you know, those sort of things probably would be useful to avoid. Absolutely. But that's your real house book. So no, no, I, I, totally, I totally agree. I totally agree. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Jenny. Um, we've, got a, we've got time for a couple more questions. And this one's um, for Wolf. Um, this one's coming from Sandra. Um, Sandra asks, um, Dr. Wolf marks how to deal with a lack of hunger eating healthy but not enough quantities okay um well i guess there's, there's a few things to un unpack there i mean one um if if you're not I, I suppose if there's a change in appetite that's different to what you're you're regularly experiencing you're finding that you're you're just not hungry for whatever reason i i i would potentially sort of monitor that and if it is this is a very drastic change that might be something that's worth just checking in with your GP about and just following up with but if in general you're someone who doesn't eat a lot I think that you know I wouldn't ask you to eat if you're if you're already full and I think listening to those cues those hunger cues and and mon and you know listening to that is important and I think if you can incorporate uh, a, a whole food healthy diet that you are comfortable with eating it's not so much about reaching a, a, a particular goal a, a particular amount of healthy food that's the same for everyone that's going to be different depending on yeah your, your appetite and your energy levels and your physical activity activity and everything so I think it's it's really an individualized thing and um, you know listening to those cues about whether you're hungry or not, I think is a, is a great thing. And I think trust that sort of intuition. Great, thanks Wolf. Um, this, we've got one uh, more question left uh, for
for, I think this could be answered by both uh, presenters. So Leo asks, um, since the lockdown began um, again in Victoria in early to mid August, um, we've been challenged, it's been challenging to uh, be outside, see real people, see our friends, a community, um, and with the lack of sport and uh, activities around, how would you propose, what are some strategies that you would propose um, other than eating healthy in terms of um, just so that we are not seeing the same day every day? Um, what are some strategies that we can prepare ourselves mentally uh, to overcome that? Um, I suppose I would say like just coming at it from a, a food perspective is um, if you're able to and enjoy it, um, using this time for cooking, I've found at least personally, using that time to cook different meals, that does add this sort of variety when, you know, a lot of the day I am on Zoom and it does become a bit of a routine, having those different flavors and, and spices and trying this, trying something new each time or, or on the weekend or anything um, can sort of add that sort of variety. Uh, Jane? Yeah, and so, Leo, I've got a little bit of a, a challenge for you then, is this thing called beginner's mind and seeing if you might be able to find a couple of things throughout the day. I mean, it feels like Groundhog Day. I know it. It feels like Groundhog Day. But is there a way that you might be able to look at these things and try to find the new thing in this day that you hadn't noticed the day before? And this might actually tie in with what I was mentioning. Did I mention it? About gratitude. <laughs> I did. That's right. Yeah. It might be also about finding, actually, Sean Acor. You could look him up. Great TED Talk. Sean Acor talks about gratitude. And he talks about writing down three new things, new things every day that you're grateful for. And what that does is gets us in the habit of scanning through to look for something new and something new and something new. So rather than always saying, I'm grateful for my whatever. I mean, I'm grateful for all of these things too. I've had breast cancer as well. And I'm grateful for the wonderful nutrition and I'm and grateful for my family. I'd probably be saying those things every time. But what Sean Acor suggests is looking for those three new things. So that you begin to see, oh, actually there's this and there's this and there's this. So a bit of a um, an invitation to experiment with that, see how you go. Great, thanks Wolf and thanks Jenny for that. Um, so that's all the questions we have time for today. Um, and I'd like to formally thank uh, once again our presenters, uh, Serena Sorrento, um, Dr. Wolfgang Marx, uh, Jenny Stedman, uh, to all of our alumni who are here uh, and present, we'd love to stay in touch with you. Uh, so please make sure you update your current contact details with us. Um, you can follow us on our Facebook and LinkedIn pages. And please also do check out our YouTube channel uh, for the webinar recordings and other great content as well. Uh, you can also submit any feedback um, about today's webinar uh, to Deakin alumni at deakin.edu.au. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and thank you once again to our presenters. Thanks to all of you for um, your participation and attendance in this webinar. It's been a great success. Um, so have a wonderful evening. Stay safe. Uh, be kind to yourself. Uh, and we look forward to reconnecting with all of you soon.